Good day to you all. This is uh, Steve Habers again, CEO of TPA in Amsterdam. Um, I'm sitting here with uh, Vicha, and um, I have uh, my colleagues uh, Kevin Kiernan and JD Troy and I'm sitting in the, on the uh, uh, east coast of America. Um, we're going to talk today about practicalities around uh, C-by-C reporting, and we have uh, quite an interesting lineup uh, today. Uh, we will start with uh, with Kevin, who uh, who will tell us a little bit about CBCR and his uh, challenges uh, in uh, in practical practically implementing CBCR after a, a short introduction. What uh, what the um, what the regulatory framework is in uh, in in the U.S. and uh, many countries around the world. And uh, Avisha will uh, will continue uh, providing a case study. With a lot of practical questions, just to get um, give you a feeling, we've been involved uh, two and a half years ago in the first automated uh, C by C reporting with one of our clients as test runs. I think we've picked up a lot of practicalities which we're trying to display. Um, subsequently, JD Choi of uh, Tax Technologies Inc., uh, one of our partners, will talk about. Uh, the shift in, uh, in paradigm on, on taxation uh, from uh, just um, a, an advisory practice to much more solution-based practice. So JD will tell us a little bit about the software implications uh, around CVCR, uh, after which Kevin will uh, give us some uh, key takeaways and, and uh, uh, to try to sort of convey to the audience uh, some practical um, messages uh, we learned from, from other cases we were working on, after which I will uh, share with you a few final remarks and, uh, and closing topics, and, and we will um, um, have a hard stop in, uh, in 55 minutes from now. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Kevin. Kevin? Uh, th thanks, Dave. Uh, so if we if we move to uh, slide four, kick things off. So we, before we get into the details of the uh, BEPS Action 13, uh, let's let, let's take a moment to kind of highlight what the you know, what the main objectives of the OECD BEPS project and the 15 actions were. So really, it boils down to to three main objectives. The first being you know coherence in tax rules across the globe and, and making sure that you know domestic rules have a certain level of coherence. Uh, the second main objective was around substance requirements and taking steps to ensure an alignment of uh, taxation with the location of economic activities and value creation. And then thirdly, it's, it's really around transparency and giving governments greater visibility to the tax fears of companies. And so that kind of brings us into Action 13, which is really the main action item within the BEPS project uh, focused on this increased transparency. Uh, we kind of look at, um, you know, the uh, tax and TP documentation uh, going forward is having really five layers. So on slide uh, four, uh, the three elements of BEPS Action 13 are the master file, the local file, and the CBC report. But we also have to be aware of uh, local TP forms that exist in many jurisdictions uh, and, and you know, still evolving you know, countries are adding to their local requirements with respect to specific TP forms uh, continuously, and then also the return, the, the tax return itself, making sure that the information on the return is, is aligned with uh, these other elements. We move to slide five. So, so slide five is really just a you know, kind of high level look at what BEPS Action 13 involves. Uh, so we have the master file, which is a uh, a high-level narrative report uh, providing information about a multinational enterprise group's business and transfer pricing policies. And this document will become available to all you know, relevant country tax authorities, depending upon where the 
multinational uh, enterprise group has, has operations. Uh, then there's the local files, uh, which are individual country level transfer pricing reports that will supplement master files and provide you know, specific TP information for each relevant country of operation. And then we have the CBC report, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's a three table uh, report that the OECD has crafted uh, to provide a high level of information about the multinational enterprises' global allocation of their revenue, profit, taxes, assets, and employees. So, you know, economic indicators of their, you know, global operations. And the CBC report um, is going to be filed and then shared or exchanged with tax authorities in countries where the multinational enterprise uh, has operations. Uh, slide six. So uh, of all the, the, the BEPS actions, the, uh, the, the final report on Action 13 has probably gained the most support from, from governments worldwide and you know for obvious reasons I think the you know the, the you know taxing authorities see this increased transparency and the level of economic information that will be provided uh, with, within the tables as a way for them to perform you know high level you know tax risk assessments of companies and as a way or a mechanism for them to you know, allocate audit resources. So what are the, you know, what are the highlights of the CBC reporting requirement? And, you know, these are contained in the, the OECD model legislation that was crafted um, upon completion of Action 13. So really, the, you know, it's, this is about the who, when, where, how, and what is required for CBC reporting. The who is, um, you know, it, it applies to multinational groups with consolidated revenue of 750 million euros or more. Uh, that's the OECD uh, threshold. Uh, when, and for the, for the OECD model legislation, they've recommended that the CBC reporting be implemented and adopted by jurisdictions uh, for fiscal years beginning on or after 1-1. 2016 with the first reports being filed by the end of the following year, so by 12-31-2017. Uh, we now know that while many jurisdictions have implemented uh, CBC reporting with the OECD recommended uh, effective date, you know, fiscal years 2016, you know there are exceptions, and uh, there are you know a handful of, of jurisdictions, you know notably uh, the U.S., uh, Japan, Switzerland, and, and a few others that have uh, adopted uh, different effective dates, uh, which we'll get into in some of the com coming slides. You know relative to how that impacts uh, multinational groups with uh, with you know diverse uh, operations. Uh, the where and the how. Uh, so essentially, what this CBC reporting will require is that the um, CBC report be filed with the parent company, excuse me, the, the parent country tax authority, and shared with tax authorities in countries where the MNE group has operations. Uh, secondary reporting mechanisms are contained in the OECD you know, model legislation. Uh, to deal with scenarios where uh, you know a, a multinational group parent jurisdiction either doesn't implement CBC reporting or has a different effective date, uh, we then fall into this um, you know local group reporting or surrogate parent entity reporting. Uh, and then what? what? What is the CBC report? As I've indicated, it's a it's a series of three uh, XML tables that will be submitted electronically, 
containing information on you know revenue, profit, taxes, um, you know uh, assets and employees on an aggregated basis. Uh, slide seven. So this this slide is really just laying out the general process that's envisioned for CBC reporting uh, and, and, a, and a series of actions that companies uh, or multinational groups will have to go through in deciding how to approach and to comply with their CBC reporting process. So the first is to identify the constituent entities in the multinational enterprise group uh, and to determine the reporting entity. So general, generally the, you know, the ultimate parent entity of the multinational enterprise group will be the reporting entity. Um, you know, the OECD model legislation provides you know, a number of uh, definitional explanations around you know, what a multinational enterprise group is, you know, what the ultimate parent entity is, um, you know, what constituent entities are, uh, but mainly uh, it's around you know, company, you know, constituent entities are, are typically going to be entities that um, you know, publicly traded uh, companies are required to consolidate for U.S. you know for, for, for GAAP purposes, so a U.S. entity under U.S. GAAP or under IFRS uh, as well. Uh, action two is uh, as part of the implementation of CBC reporting. Uh, there are required notifications that are being uh, implemented in many of the jurisdictions, not all, but many jurisdictions that are implementing CBC reporting requirements also contain required notification uh, requirements. Uh, the details on these are still evolving. Uh, some countries had uh, notification requirements as of the end of 2016. Some of the uh, countries that, uh, that adopted the 2016 fiscal year filing had notification requirements uh, before the end of 2016. The OECD is actively uh, looking at areas of continuing guidance. This is one of them where they're stressing the need for some flexibility here during this transitional period and for countries to perhaps give some additional time uh, because there are some, you know, some areas of the CBC reporting uh, that are still evolving. So. Um, this is an area that you know companies are really going to need to look at their countries of operation um, and to look at what the notification requirements are in each of those jurisdictions uh, so that they can monitor and, and, and follow their requirements uh, for, notif for notifications. Uh, action three is that the reporting entity prepares the CBC report. Uh, action four, the reporting entity would electronically file the CBC report in the tax jurisdiction of residence. And then action five, uh, the tax authorities would affect the automatic exchange of the CBC reports with other tax authorities. And this is, this is you know, going to be based upon uh, either um, the multilateral instrument, so there's a um, multilateral competent authority agreement on automatic exchange of CBC reports. Uh, there are currently, I believe, 57 signatories to that document. Uh, there's also bilateral, you know, this can be done through bilateral uh, uh, agreements or through tax information exchange agreements and, and, EU, uh, and the EU automatic exchange. Um, one notable. Kevin, yeah. Kevin this, this is Dave. Uh, just a, a remark on this, especially the uh, the, the electronic filing uh, doesn't necessarily allow you to add a cover letter to to a CBC uh, report or the three tables you are filing. Um, I, I would recommend, uh, which I do to all my clients, that you have a cover letter exchange with the tax authorities about how 
and when they're allowed to use this information. The reason why is that tax authorities will use double tax treaties uh, uh, or, or the other means, as Kevin just explained, to exchange this C by C reporting, which contains a lot of commercially sensitive uh, but also tax sensitive data to the rest of the world in countries where you have operations in. If and insofar tax authorities are not um, are not meeting certain uh, ISO standards, um, so security standards, safety standards on on, on IT, on on personnel, uh, on anything which leaks this information to the public domain, then tax authorities uh, of the parent country cannot afford to distribute and, and exchange that uh, that whole set of three tables. To these uh, to these governments, so one way or the other, you need to have a communication either with the Ministry of Finance or the relevant authorities in your country of the parent country uh, company to to convey that message that they should not um, display uh, sorry exchange this information to countries which are not meeting these safety requirements. I think that's. Uh, just a little bit outside the, the regular instructions, but it's, uh, as we noticed, a very, um, very important feature, especially when commercial sensitive information and or tax sensitive information is captured in, in these uh, three forms. Great, great, great point. And I think uh, just following on that, um, you know, the U.S. is, one, is really a notable exception to the current signatories to the multilateral instrument, the uh, the MCAA, um, and and it looks like they are more likely to go the route of bilateral agreements, and primarily due to their concerns around the uh, confidentiality and safeguarding of CBC reporting information. Uh, slide eight. So here what I wanted to touch upon, because uh, I know we have a lot of U.S. multinational group uh, representatives in, in, in today's audience, we wanted to just kind of give a quick overview of where the U.S. is relative to CBC. So final regulations on CBC reporting were published uh, on, on June 30th of last year. Uh, the U.S. regs are modeled on the OECD recommendations under Action 13. Uh, it, the, the U.S. CBC reporting applies to ultimate parent entities of a U.S. multinational group with annual revenues of 850 million U.S. or more for the immediately preceding accounting period. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we 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 don't have many companies falling into some of these differentials on the on the revenue threshold. Um, between uh, thresholds that are in local legislation and, and what the U.S. is. So this does create some, you know, an area of, of concern that companies are going to have to look at, in, in particular if they're close to that threshold, if they're clearly over, then it's probably not, not that big of an issue. Uh, it applies to reporting periods of the ultimate parent entity that begin on or after June 30, 2016. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, the U.S. is one of these jurisdictions that has a, a later, you know, effective date, which um, is uh, I'll touch upon later in the slide. Uh, so, what what is the uh, ultimate parent entity of a U.S. multinational group? Uh, it's really a U.S. business entity that owns directly or indirectly. Uh, a sufficient interest in one or more business entities, at least one of which is organized or tax resident outside the U.S., such that the U.S. business entity either must consolidate uh, if they're, uh, if they're uh, a publicly traded company under their U.S. GAAP, or if they're not um, you know, a, a public, uh, publicly traded entity, uh, that, they, you know, that, it, that they would be required to consolidate uh, if they were a publicly traded company. That, that's, that's what the second element is. Uh, the U.S. has uh, released a draft of Form 8975, which is the CBC report. Um, we have 
copies and the appendices of the OECD tables. So the U.S. has is, is, is followed the, you know, the model legislation relative to the form uh, and related instructions in draft form have been issued. Uh, more recently, the U.S. has addressed the, you know, this delayed U.S. effective date and uh, a RevProc has just been issued in 2017, RevProc 2017-23, indicating that the U.S. will allow voluntary filing of Form 8975 uh, by the U.S. parent entities of U.S. multinational groups for reporting periods beginning on or after January 1, but before the June 30th effective date in the U.S. rule. So this allows, you know, um, you know, you know, U.S. parent surrogate filings uh, to deal with this transitional issue. Uh, so from there, I think I'll, I'll turn it to Avisha. She's going to uh, talk about some of the practical uh, considerations of CBC reform. Thank you, Kevin, for taking us through what CBC means and what are the concepts associated with it that MNEs need to be aware of. Uh, what I'm going to do is take you to briefly through this case study and uh, tell you what happens when an ME really tries to file a C by C report, what issues they encounter, what should they be careful of, and what to do, what should what things they should be careful of while filing, before filing, and what repercussions might entail after filing. So let's start with just looking at the structure of the ME on the slide. It's a U.S. headquartered m and &E with a global subholding in the Netherlands, which has subsidiaries in Australia, China, Germany, U.K., and the Netherlands. So let's analyze this case one by one. First of all, why is the selection of data that you put in your CBCR so important? Let's look at the picture on the slide right now. This is just an example of individual constituent entities uh, operating margin, gross margin, and number of employees to the total groups, gross margin, operating margin, and number of employees ratio conducted just on an example basis. Uh, so if you see, the 6% employees located in the Netherlands generate 54% of operating margin. As I said, this is just an example of one of the analysis that can be conducted using the CBCR data. Uh, think of all the various ratio analysis that can be conducted by the uh, OECD or by the tax authorities of all countries with whom the CBCR reports will be shared with. I have included a slide on in the appendix on various kinds of outlier analysis or the ratio analysis that we perform in order for you to be prepared about identifying what inconsistencies may exist in your current framework that you should think about maybe rectifying during the course of the year before you file your CBCR at the end of the year. What you should do to come up to identify whether such inconsistency exists, use financial simulations, use some projections for the rest of the year, and try to find out if any such thing exists in your m and &E. As an addition to that, you should also try to conduct such simulations on the industry that you operate in, just in order to find out how far off, if at all, you are from the industry-wide ratios. This is because the tax authorities will not only receive the master file, local file, local tax return, and CBCR for your company, but also maybe for many of your competitors. And if there is a standard industry-wide ratio that can be, say, applicable to your company, and your ratios do not seem to match up, at the very least, it will raise a question from the tax authority. Uh, another example of just this, of why inconsistencies might arise and why is it important on selecting the data and how you report the selected data, is the use of different accounting principles. Well, accounting principles play a role when you file your local tax returns. So say, for example, there's a U.S. m and &E. Which has wide oper which has operations in the in Ireland, and reports a large earnings before tax in Ireland, but the tax on tax paid and reported on those earnings is negligible or even zero sometimes, uh, and that has been reported following certain standards that are to be used for Irish companies. And on a group basis, when the parent entity files the CBCR, all the OECD has stated that it is all right to use 
any accounting standards, even internal management accounts, or as long as all entities' uh, numbers are converted to the same accounting, using the same accounting principles. However, if you have used, say, the parent entities in the U.S. and you use U.S. GAAP accounting principles to report your CBCR, but in Ireland, when you file a local tax return or any local filings, you follow different principles. So just by looking at these two numbers, which may or may not be telling the same story, it will definitely raise a question. And in light of the aggressive tax behavior that we are seeing from tax authorities right now, it may even lead to an audit. So that is why we would say it's very crucial you pay a lot of attention and put a lot of preparatory work into selecting what goes out in your CBCR. For this purpose, we also offer at TPA, we prepared an operating manual which links tax with IT and finance so as to help the IT professionals figure out which data to extract from your tax and financial uh, numbers and see at that very point in time whether such numbers are creating an inconsistency at the very uh, outset. So now after focusing on why is it important to, uh, why it's important to select your data, let's talk about what you should report. Here, this is an example of the first table that you have to file for your CBCR. In this, I will not focus too much on the questions that have already been talked about quite a lot. I will try to focus on just five questions that we have identified to still have no a clear answer on. First of all, if there is a um, threshold, the OECD has said that the threshold requirement for filing a CBCR is 750 million euros or equivalent in the domestic currency. However, say if due to currency fluctuations, a country's um, threshold goes above 750 million uh, euros, and that is the jurisdiction of the parent entity. And while the parent entity has a constituent entity in another country, which has a threshold of 750 million euros exactly, the second parent, the second entity cannot force the parent entity to file a CBCR when the revenues of the company may be in excess of 750 million, but below the specified threshold stated in that particular country. It might be due to the currency fluctuations that, that for that particular year it is high, and in the next year it will be low. But while it is higher, NME cannot be forced to file a CBCR uh, in, that, in that jurisdiction. Then when we talk about, um, I've already focused a bit on the accounting principles that raise a question, but now if we talk about investment companies or partnerships, the OECD has specified that you should use accounting consolidation rules, especially for investment companies. You should use accounting consolidation rules to decide whether or not to include the investee company's income in the investment parent company's income. If the accounting consolidation rules allow you, only then do you combine both and do they both together form an m and &E group. If not, the constituent, the investee company and the investor company do not form an m and &E group whose income together has to be checked whether or not it falls under, uh, falls over the 750 million euro threshold. Another issue that we have identified exists with regard to permanent establishment. The OECD states that the permanent establishments have to be reported as separate individual entities, the tax jurisdiction for which has to be stated to be the jurisdiction and in which they are formed, the, those of which under which they are formed. Uh, and the income from related and unrelated parties has to be the exact income that the permanent establishment derives on itself. However, when we come to the block of accumulated earnings, at that point in time, OECD is indecisive about whether the permanent establishment has to report anything in that column or all of its accumulated earnings have to be reported in the row providing information about the parent entity. So unless, uh, and as uh, we had just brought up earlier, there is no way to explain such inconsistencies in when you are doing electronic filing of CBC reports. Therefore, it becomes even more important for companies to add an additional letter of clarification to the tax authorities, informing them of what assumptions have been made or what or how the data has to be read 
and that sheet should also be shared with all tax authorities with which such CBCR is being shared. Now, um, talking about a question of um, who has to file, uh, the OECD has made a provision for surrogate filing in case there is no mechanism for CBC filing in the jurisdiction of the parent or if there is a systemic failure or if there is no means of exchange of communication on that. However, there is additional, an addition that has been made to that which is voluntary filing. Voluntary filing is when the ultimate parent entity, for example, say the U.S., has not yet um, set up a mechanism to allow for CBC report filing as they have started for, uh, they have allowed for the filing of CBCR six months after the date specified by the OECD. So during that six month period, the other constituent entity, the, the group will have two options, either to report voluntarily in the jurisdiction of the parent entity, say the US, or appoint a surrogate entity for the group that can, for that year, file the fee by fee report that has to still be shared with the ultimate parent entity's jurisdiction, how or do a voluntary filing. It, this option has been left open for MNEs to choose from. Uh, Alicia, the last point, uh, yes, Kevin. Yeah, one, one point I would make on surrogate parent filing, the, the U.S. final uh, regs do not allow um, you know, foreign parented multinational groups to to do surrogate filing in the U.S. I think the only exception will be on um, foreign entities in U.S. possessions and territories. So that, that's one area where, you know, or, or one major jurisdiction that won't allow uh, surrogate parent filings is the U.S. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So that even stresses on more about what the importance of voluntary filing in the U.S. Eh? Uh, and the last point I would like to make in this regard is regarding disclosure. Uh, as we have been discussing, there's very sensitive tax information that is currently being shared between, uh, in the CBCR and will be shared with many tax authorities. And in case of EU, if you were to follow the EU Public Reporting Directive, a lot of this information will be made public as well. So at this point in time, although in February of 2017, OECD has set up a peer review mechanism to check that will continue up till 2020 to check for to check for various things such as implementation framework, exchange framework, confidentiality framework. But it is yet to be seen how that will progress. Therefore, you should be careful that your data will be shared not only with the tax authorities but could also be made public, such as in case of the EU, to all of your stakeholders. This stresses on the importance of corporate tax governance. That means that your corporate tax strategy should also, in a, as a preventive measure, become a part of your corporate governance so that your stakeholders are already aware of what, um, they are, what the tax strategies are being followed by the group that they are a part of. Yeah, just to, uh, to illustrate that, uh, Afisha, I think if you if you have a corporate governance in place um, that um, allows a local managing director to disclose uh, this information, say you file it as a parent company with the IRS, uh, the IRS um, is doing an exchange, or in absence of an exchange, you allow your managing director to file. Um, uh, in uh, in that other country, probably goes through the Ministry of Finance. Uh, then there is a potential liability. Uh, basically, what BAPS is doing it says, okay, anything which is wrong on taxation um, will filter through to a, a liability issue at the level of the legal representative of a local taxpayer. So, let's assume this paper goes to um, uh, the Belgium tax authorities and your Belgium and, and the who files the Belgium tax return uh, suddenly finds out that your CBCR tells uh, that that Ireland has one million per FTE profits and the Belgium uh, profitability uh, coming from that outlier analysis in your CBCR is only a hundred thousand so suddenly the Belgium tax authorities are very worried and could uh, come after the managing director to clarify this issue at hand. And I think then 
the corporate governance who is ultimately within the, the group um, accountable for signing off on the CBCR when it goes to the tax authorities may, be a, may become a very big thing. Thank you, Steve, for summing up uh, the point very accurately. With this, I would now hand over the floor to JD, who will talk further about what audit risks arise and how to mitigate them. JD? Thank you, Avisha. Yeah. Um, Avisha, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, good. I'm going to talk about how the global taxation paradigm is uh, being shifted from very legalistic approach to economic fairness approach and what are the risks that are going to be uh, increased as a result and also how to handle that risk um, through the um, uh, various means uh, including the employment of a, uh, advanced tools. So first, generally the Global taxation was based on the old American case um, called uh, Gregory versus Helvering in 1935, which established two very important legal doctrines. One is established uh, at, the, at the Supreme Court level, business purpose doctrine and doctrine of substance over form. So many companies follow this paradigm, the legal paradigm, in formulating their tax affairs and along the way to the Supreme Court at the circuit court level, famous judge, Judge Leonard Hand, uh, established another uh, legal axiom that you can establish affairs in a way that can minimize your taxation and you know, paying, no, paying more taxes is not even a patriotic duty. So these three um, principle really were driven uh, driving the American taxpayers and established tax planning business along the way. And uh, let's move to the next slide. With the introduction of BEPS, now we are moving a lot more toward the economic value approach. Um, and they're trying to achieve global coordination uh, for comprehensive legal agreements and establishing new legal framework within the uh, participating uh, uh, countries. In their own uh, document uh, uh, issued by OECD, a uh, document named uh, Myths and Facts About Apps, it says closing the gaps in the international tax rules that allow multinational corporations to legally but artificially shift profits to low or no tax jurisdiction as their objective. So there's a very uh, interesting term, the legally but artificially shift profits. This kind of ignores the, uh, the legal paradigm that was uh, well established. And they also answer you know, whether the um, shifting profits is really illegal. In, the, in its own statement, it says it, it is not illegal and they're uh, simply taking advantage of the current rules of each country and they state it is an issue of fairness. Now, once we move from legalistic approach to the fairness approach, then we move from a objective standard to a very subjective standard. So let's move to the next st uh, uh, slide. Avisha, let's move to the next slide. So the effect of this paradigm shift is really a significant increase in uncertainty in multinational tax administration. Say um, the fairness in the eyes of one may not be the same fairness in the eyes of the other. We are moving from very, well, not very objective, but uh, although there are significant uncertainties and in international taxation, but it was far more certain than the, um, uh, under the legalistic approach of taxation than that of the, um, um, the new paradigm under which we're looking for the fairness, economic fairness, uh, based on the economic analysis. 
So the end result is going to be an increase in overall tax cost. Um, there, the, in, in their statement, OECD statement, um, their frequently asked questions, they, um, they answer the, the question, when you know, what are the next steps in BEPS? And they're trying to end the double non-taxation and the artificial shifting of profits. In their estimate, uh, the tax avoidance um, reduces 100 to 250 billion dollars of tax revenues from various countries. So that is, in their mind, the target amount of increased um, in tax revenue uh, as a result of BEPS implementation. Let's Let's move to the um, next slide. So once the BEPS is in place, what will change? Um, under their statement, again, they're trying, the OECD and BEPS initiative is trying to reduce the harmful tax com competition across the world. Well, this is exactly what caused and enabled a base erosion and uh, profit shifting, i.e. the countries compete for the, uh, the multinational companies to come into their country, create in, um, by, by providing them tax incentives. I won't name the countries. But the potential problem of this approach, this is a very general approach that um, well, OECD BEPS um, members are trying to push. The potential problem is that it really um, um, con con uh, creates a, a uh, conflict on the issue of national sovereignty and economic realities. Some countries will um, be driven more to uh, create employment and under the current um, economic climate more countries are competing even more for the, 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 the uh, employments and, and, and other uh, revenue sources. A uh, very good example is UK uh, that is um, about to uh, uh, lower its tax rate. And even the US is trying to lower the tax rate and they're competing for the businesses around the world. And it's very difficult to harmonize and eliminate the harmful tax competition of, uh, across the countries. So my statement is that good luck with this approach. It, this just is not going to happen. So what will actually happen is more likely that increase in tax costs will be done through the globally coordinated tax audits. And this is very low cost and high return approach. And this is very likely to happen. But potential problem under this shifting of paradigms from legalistic approach to fairness approach is that it's very subjective. That the fairness approach is very subjective and the companies really have a very vague guidance on what will be fair. I mean, when you ask the economists, you know, what is fair, they will probably never be able to tell you straight uh, what is fair for um, for the um, for the country and for the company? Although we do have to uh, do the uh, value chain analysis and other um, analysis to be able to establish that fairness, uh, at least uh, cross on a cross country basis and cross uh, cross industry basis, to be able to establish the proper audit defense. So let's go to the next slide. So if we is agree that there will be significant increase in global audit activities, then we will have to understand what will act what are the global audit related activities that are going on to enhance the tax administration's ability to uh, to perform the global audit. Well, there has been significant activities. 
um, at a globe on a global scale. UN, uh, OECD, IMF, and World Bank. They had a they have a joint program that focuses on a tax avoidance and tax evasion. Although they could not establish the estimate on how much tax revenue they, they lose on the tax evasion, they established the, the estimate on tax avoidance, uh, especially on best, and they estimated to be 100 to 250 billion. Given the population, Teddy, yep. Teddy, Teddy, I think given the time slot uh, allotted to us, we need to uh, maybe uh, move forward on a few slides. Uh, I leave it up to you, but uh, okay. I think we have some questions from the audience as well we want to address, so uh, if you take another five minutes. Sure, I'll make it brief, yeah. So <clears throat> there, there are significant enhancement in audit programs. Um, let's move to the next slide. They have been building the, on a global scale, an audit toolkit. Uh, they established a BEPS framework to be able to collect more information. They have established global exchange programs on the various programs. Uh, Vishal, let's move to the next slide. They not only have built the tools and exchange uh, network, but also they're using the existing global tax organizations to propagate those tools and implement uh, the, the, the actual audit programs through various organizations. If you look at the list, you have a American continent, European continent, you have a Commonwealth, African nations, and Pacific Island. This really covers the whole world, and they have they are using these organizations to effectuate the implementation of audit programs. The next slide, if we go to the next slide, please. Once the BEPS is established, they're going to be able to get standardized financial information across the world, and which will allow them to build a cross-sectional analysis across the industry. They also are going to accumulate information, and they're going to build a time series analysis. If you have, um, if you search for a Barclays, a country by country reporting, that uh, somehow their uh, reporting made, was made public, and if you look at their reports in detail, you're going to see that um, the various countries will look at that country by country report um, from their own perspective, and they will have different challenges, um, different attack points to the same company based on the same reporting. So standardized reporting across period, across period of time will provide the auditor significant advantage in, uh, in collecting information. On top of that, if you look at the next slide, the master file and local file will provide a qualitative information, significant qualitative information, including the supporting documentation. And these documentation will give their, them insight. In fact, the um, uh, OECD just issued on January 24th their toolkit draft, which goes into the details of what type of questions that they should ask if they were to, um, uh, to challenge the filing on the BEPS. Uh, if you move to the next slide and the next one. And the big, the big question becomes, what should be your next step? On the, the, um, this is the, uh, the quote from the uh, Sonchu's Art of War, uh, a very famous um, uh, military strategy book. It says, if you know your enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So we know what the OECD and global organizations are going to do, i.e. they're going to increase the audit. So we'll have to know what we should do. So knowing your company and your company's position on transfer pricing will be the key to the audit defense. Let's move to the next slide, Avisha. 
So a general statement is that learning your company, collecting global information, and perform your internal cost country value chain analysis, and then you need to prepare for the concurrent audit, which will be based on very data-driven approach uh, rather than a, a ad hoc approach by country. You need to centralize, if you move to the uh, next slide, in this case, we had an implementation with a client and they showed the, on their um, 10K, they had a reduction in uh, economic slowth in Brazil, while their BEPS report showed increase in, uh, in their activities. So this consistency needs to be checked within, a, within their um, reporting before the BEPS reporting is done. So the best strategy, uh, the, let's move to the next, strategy, next slide is to be proactive. You know your company and you will be prepared. The next big question is how? How do you prepare for all these? So if you move to the next slide, the, the mechanics of your defensive uh, strategy should be that of centralizing your data and centralizing your analysis by global participants. And that will uh, simply allow you to, um, to defend uh, multinational concurrent audit, and hopefully you can, um, uh, you can minimize uh, uh, the audit risk. And along that line, we have developed the BEPS software that will allow you to centralize your data and then build the uh, intelligence and also the um, it uh, allows you to simulate your BEPS results and allows you to reconcile your uh, BEPS financial reporting to your local country tax returns and um, build the, build the uh, notification features and tracking of the, all the local country compliance requirements and the notification features so every company that are within your group can be notified of the local country uh, filing requirements. Okay, I'll end here, uh, given the time, and I'll pass it back to uh, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, uh, Kevin, this is Dave. Uh, just to uh, look at uh, one of the questions, which I think is uh, directed to you. How is an LLC create, uh, treated for C, B, C by C purposes? And uh, that is a question on the stateless entities. Um, so if you want to address that uh, together with your uh, key takeaways, uh, please do so. Yeah. All right. So let, let me uh, just quickly run through some of the, the key takeaways and then we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can touch on, on that specific question. So, uh, you know, the, the, the highlights here are that the, uh, you know, the, the best transparency requirements are going to provide taxing authorities with you know, really unprecedented insight into the multinational organization's tax matters. Um, you know, access to the global information means that the, the taxing authorities can target uh, multinational enterprises where they perceive a lack of substance or, or, or a loss of tax revenue. Um, it will require multinationals to, to conduct deeper analysis of their value chains uh, to ensure, you know, uh, you know the, this, ec this economic alignment of, um, of value creation. Um, tax departments are going to need to clearly identify the roles and responsibilities of their global tax, and I would add uh, finance and HR staff to support the new annual re reporting requirements and some of the data elements that are part of the CBC reporting. Um, and then, you know, multinationals as part of their analytic, uh, analytical work should make sure that the, you know, the CBC reporting information aligns with their returns and their uh, local uh, TP documentation, master files and local files, and that it all tells a uh, consistent story. Uh, and then lastly, tax executives should, should conduct uh, tax planning and governance under the assumption that all information will be made public, you know, at some point, and that it, that attorney-client privileges will continue to erode. 
Um, the next slide was really just a kind of high level uh, BEPS compliance timeline. I think due to the timing, we'll, we'll kind of leave that for the participants to take a look at. Uh, it's really just a kind of high level look at the steps that companies should be following in 2017 uh, as they go about their work in um, data gathering and analysis to be in a position to file their CBC reports that are, that are due in 2017. Uh, Thanks very much, uh, Kevin. This uh, was uh, excellent. Um, just uh, for your information, uh, we added and that will the package will be distributed to all of you a list which is published on the OECD website, uh, which contains about 50 countries which have, through primary law or secondary law, implemented C by CR. Just as a few takeaways there, uh, I think um, about 11 of the 50 companies you see here have postponed the C by, C by C legislation to enter at a later date than January 1, 2016. So you have to uh, assume if 40 countries did, it's, it's a little bit oil on water. So it spreads, so you need to deal with it now. So timing is, uh, is of the essence and not necessarily the U.S. timing, which gives you a little bit more time if you would only file in 17. Um, Another element uh, which JD brought to the table is, I think, the uh, whole cohesion between your tax return, your master file, your local file, and your local forms, and your CBCR. They all need to tell the same story. And I think uh, we see a lot of uh, in-house organizations which are still siloed in the sense that you have sales and use tax, you have a compliance department, you have a risk management department not necessarily bridges are being built across. And this time, um, given the massive uh, number and data points landing on the, on the desk of the tax inspector, and I think um, uh, following uh, JD's uh, quote um, uh, on, on warfare, yes, it's an official war out there and, and you need to be prepared. So you need to know yourself as good as uh, you know your enemy. Um, Last but not least, and thanks for your uh, your presence, we do run a um, VCA, a value chain analysis webinars in the next two weeks uh, for, for your information, which addresses uh, the other point JD and, uh, and Kevin and Avisha brought to the table about looking at the holistic picture. So if you slice one piece of the pie, you need to know what portion you give away, information-wise, margin-wise, etc. Um, and uh, uh, TPA Global uh, will organize um, in the time frame April, May, three uh, workshops on how to perform your own value chain analysis uh, in-house as, as an in-house tax or a financial uh, professional um, in, the, in Amsterdam, Singapore, and New York. New York. So we will uh, keep you posted on that. With that, I close this session of today. Again, thanks for your attention and, and your presence. And, uh, and Avisha, JD, and uh, Kevin, thanks for, uh, for the presentations. With this, uh, we close this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for your participation.